hoping to learn or your favorite Illinois pollinator. Um, and we can just kick that off. And then with that, Angela, I'll turn it over to you get out. <laughs> to go ahead and start your presentation. All right, you hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, this is new for me, so bear with me. I wish I could, I could actually see myself, but you guys can't, so I guess that's all right. Um, just a little background on myself. Uh, I've worked for nearly 24 years as a field representative for the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission uh, here in West Central Illinois. I live in the furthest west town in the state, about uh, 35 miles north of Quincy. Um, not very many people get over this way, but I kind of like it that way. So, some things are good about that. I work from a home office normally, so this hasn't been a huge transition. Just the Zoom is a little bit different. Um, but I also homeschool, so that's kind of not been a big deal either. Uh, for the first two decades of my career, I was a plant ecologist. That was kind of needed for the job. Um, but obviously, as you go out and look at plants, there's insects on them. Um, I did uh, butterfly uh, surveys uh, starting early in my career since 1997. Um, so I kind of what became the go-to person for DNR for butterflies and skippers whenever they had any questions they came to me. Um, during uh, 2010 to 2014 I mentored a couple of uh, graduate students that were doing research on bees. I also participated in some bio blitzes in which I got to uh, help the insect teams because they were the ones in the most need. There's more insect species than anything so they needed help. Um, so that kind of got me hooked uh, into the need for insects. Um, my husband's a really good photographer and we have all sorts of equipment. So we had a lot of uh, macro lenses. So I basically just picked the camera, picked the lens up, went outside, decided to uh, teach myself insects through photography, which is kind of the easiest way to do that. Um, there's a lot of different things nowadays that really help photography and make it the way with digital, you know, you can take unlimited mega pictures. It's not like the old slides where you had to pay for every single photo you developed. Um, so with each of these uh, slides that I'll be showing, I have a picture of one of my insects that I've taken because I kind of like to showcase them. They do no good just sitting on my computer. I like to show them off a little bit. I have labeled all the ones with the scientific name for the insect and the common name for the plant associate. So I probably won't talk about most of them in this presentation, but the information is there. So if I can get this to move forward. Not wanting to go forward. Do I have to turn something on here? All right, there we go. There. All right, the advantages of photography. Why use photography? Working for the Nature Preserves Commission, uh, we really uh, promote non-lethal methods. Um, what we're doing is trying to protect habitat and the native uh, critters that live on that habitat. Uh, so we require a lot of permits and there's a lot of questions asked, do you need to kill it? So I kind of have that mentality in me for working for the commission for so long. Um, so photographs were kind of an easy way to go. We don't have to, the reason to kill that wriggle fritillary, it's easy to identify through a photograph. Another advantage of photography is photographs are a lot easier to share and to store. I can send my photograph out to a whole bunch of different people and I'm not really giving much away. I'm not giving away a specimen. I'm not having to worry about, you know, mailing postage for that specimen. Easily done by email. Uh, websites offer identification assistance. This didn't seem to be the case about 10, 15 years ago, but now there are a couple really wonderful websites out there that you post your pictures on and experts from all over will get, go on there and help you identify your insect. Uh, my two favorites are bugguide.net and inaturalist.org. I use both those two sites because they identify more than just say bumblebee watch, just as bumblebees. Um, there's another uh, bee spotter, just as honeybees and bumblebees. Well, I want more. I want to know all the insects I can. So I use those first two. Another advantage is time. I don't spend as much time. I mean, my job isn't just going out looking for insects. I need to protect land. I need to work with landowners and sign up land and conservation programs. So this is kind of a side project for me. So having less time spent out in the field uh, and less time you know, preparing insect specimens is really helpful and allows me to do this on my job. 
I don't have the patience, the collection space, or the time, the motivation to collect insects. Photography is much easier. Uh, it also provides additional information. A dead bug in a bowl does not tell me which plant that was visiting. It also doesn't show me about that insect's behavior when it was alive. And a lot of times, you know, things sitting in the bottom of a bowl look totally different than they do when they're alive. They're prettier when they're alive. Uh, goals for my study. Uh, basically, I used, let's see, I established baseline species list for a bunch of my sites. I wanted to go to nature preserve sites that are long-term protected, the sites that I manage. I wanted to find specialist pollinators and I wanted to record the plant associates with all of those pollinators. I wanted to determine better ways to guide our management on these sites. And I, if possible, I want to try to develop methods to evaluate natural areas based on the insect community. Can we tell if it's a high quality community based solely on the insects? Because right now we base everything on plants, which is great, I love plants still. Um, but sometimes the insects don't necessarily agree with the botanists. Sometimes insects like grade C, you know, kind of moderate quality habitat, as opposed to the high quality habitat. You may have fewer conservative insects, but you have less of them and less diversity in some of the high quality communities. Methods. I wanted to do six sites per year uh, in my area. Uh, I selected sites that were more than 10 acres. The little one acre cemeteries just don't have very much diversity. I have so many sites. Um, I thought if I did, you know, 10 plus acres, I could try to get to most of my larger sites every five years. So I've got a whole plan for the next five years, three years now, I've been doing it for two years, to try to do six sites a year. I, want, I chose sites with different natural community types uh, originally. Now I'm just trying to do as many as I can, you know, within this, the limits and constraints. I run the surveys at least four times during the season. So once in the spring, April, May, and I'll do one in June, one in July, and one in August, September to catch the late blooming plants. So that gives me a different floral array of uh, pollinators. I do meandering transect routes. So I don't do grids and things like that, walk in a straight line. I essentially want as many species as I can. So I go out there and I look for the patches of flowers that are attracting the insects. And that's kind of where I go. If there's an established trail or the path of least resistance, that's always the best route because I can get more accomplished if I'm not fighting through bush honeysuckle multicolor rose. And I really want to find those patches of flowers. So survey specifications. Um, I merged and adapted surveys from Xerces uh, pollinator surveys for the Midwest and the fish and wildlife surveys for bombus, bumblebees. Um, originally, they, they, uh, their plans designed to spend some time catching things in little vials and then catch and release. I found that that took me way too much time. Uh, I'm a lot more efficient using my camera and recording what I see rather than to try to stop and catch and release. I'm, I've got a method going. I've been doing photography for, for a while. And so I just try to keep moving so I'm not counting the same thing twice. Obviously, if I find a patch, I stay there a little longer, um, but I always try to keep moving so I'm not counting, the, seeing the same, flushing the same bee again and again. I collect information on pollinator species and the floral associations. I try to conduct all my surveys within a period of 60 to 80 minutes. Once in a while, I go up to 90, but I really want to cut it off um, because I want all the counts to be about the same. I wanted to collect more information on all the pollinators. Uh, the more time I spend, the more, um, I guess, sense I get and ideas that I get about what the pollinators are doing and why and what plants they're associated with. I wanted to use my camera to document as many pollinators as I possibly could. So I'm pretty obsessive about getting the picture first and then writing everything down. Just to kind of show you, here's my messy scribble field data sheet. Um, I just found it's a lot easier for me just to take a blank piece of paper out into the woods with me and just to scribble hash marks. Um, and then I scribble, you know, uh, scrolls of the different plant species. Um, and that's kind of what I do out in the field. And then I go back to the office and then I put it into my formal uh, pollinator monitoring data sheet. Um, I try to do this as soon as possible when I get back to the office while my mind's still fresh. Um, I find that, you know, I can go through my photographs and if I forgot to write one down on my data sheet that I can kind of merge those together and make sure I've got a complete picture of everything that I saw. Obviously, I, I usually see more than six species there so it goes on to the next page, but that kind of gives you a sense of some of the information that I'm tracking. 
Uh, just to go over uh, my 12 study sites that I've sampled the last two years, just to give you a little background of some of the sites over here in West Central Illinois. Um, this one's really close to my house. Uh, Mississippi River Sand Hills is a high quality sand hill prairie. So the whole thing is a bunch of old sand dunes um, near the old floodplain of the Mississippi River. Um, it was a sand quarry at one time, so there's a lot of disturbance uh, down the bottoms. But the sand hills themselves are really important because there's a lot of loose open sand for ground nesting insects to nest in. However, interestingly, um, I was basically counted the least number of individuals at this site. I don't know why that is. The diversity of species wasn't bad, but I didn't see as many individuals at this site. Uh, the next one, Samuel Barnum Mead Savannah, is named after uh, Samuel Barnum Mead uh, of Mead's Milkweed, Mead's Sedge. Um, was a famous uh, botanist slash uh, doctor of, the, of his time. He kind of founded one of these towns in Hancock County and he spent time traveling through this area uh, from I think it's 1836 through I think he died in 1885. So he obsessively collected plants and documented all the flora of Hancock County. And so I want to honor Mead uh, with this nature preserve dedication. Uh, this site is a 10 acre prairie savanna remnant surrounded by 31 acres of successional field and planted prairie. Uh, interestingly, um, the quality of the site's a little higher. So I had the most individuals and most individuals per hour, and I had the highest number of beetles and butterflies at this site. Cecil White Prairie Land and Water Reserve is right on uh, one of my main roads. I travel back and forth to Macomb. So I go to this site a lot. Um, it was, it's a hill prairie. It was pretty uh, covered with trees and then we got some money and we opened it up. So that's why all the bergamot is doing so well out there. Uh, it's surrounded by oak woodlands. There's a stream and there's some successional field nearby. The successional field presence is really important for a higher diversity of pollinators because they really like some of those weedy flowers that bloom and produce a lot of pollen and nectar. So those sites give me a lot more diversity sometimes. Um, Cecil White had the highest diversity of um, butterfly, at least the butterfly quality index was higher than that, on that site than any other. And the diversity of beetles was really good, especially flower longhorns. And I'll show you a picture of those later. Short Fork Seep Nature Preserve is up north of Macomb, uh, near where I used to live, uh, in a town called Good Hope. Uh, that site is an old, uh, it's basically a remnant uh, seep and sedge meadow surrounded by grazed timber and former pasture land. Um, so other than the seeps, the quality of the site is pretty poor. In fact, it gets so brushy, having been grazed for 80 years, that I can't walk um, out basically very far away from the road just to this uh, first uh, seep area after that first spring count because the multiflora rose and the bush honeysuckle and everything gets so thick and dense, I can't push my way through and still hold my camera and my notepad. So I stayed near the road. But amazingly enough, uh, when one of the kind of the successional old field areas up by the road, I went and scattered my, some of my prairie shaft and some of the seeds that I, I didn't get to use. I collected from the nearby railroad to plant at my prairie about five miles away. So I took my trash and I would dump it out here. For years and years, I did this. And it's grown up into a planted prairie. And amazing diversity came to this planted prairie area right along the road, even though I couldn't go in very far. So my sampling area was much smaller uh, the amount of diversity that was found at the site was just unexpected. It had the highest diversity, 181 species for all the surveys. Uh, Mead, uh, Savannah, and Cecil White both had 180, so they're really all really close, but I didn't expect this site to be that high because of the um, degraded forest areas essentially in old fields. The next one, Harper Rector Woods, is down along the uh, Spoon River in Fulton County. It's kind of a uh, bottomland, dry mesic uh, ridge uh, forest. It's all forested. Um, the stinging nettle was terrible in the summer. I waited till it got 70 degrees and I put on a pair of uh, you know, coveralls so I could actually protect my legs from the nettles. Wasn't a lot in the deep forest. So most of my insects were actually observed in the summer on the edge of the crop field that I had to walk by to get to this site. So I assumed a lot of those insects probably used this site so I went ahead and counted along the edge of the field because there was weedy flowers and, you know, sometimes even native flowers like bellflower, um, great blue lobelia, things like that were growing along the edge of the field and there were pollinators on them. So they got counted. Joshua Lindahl Hill Prairie is up in the Quad Cities. It is another um, Lus Hill Prairie uh, surrounded by oak woods. 
Uh, that's actually overlooking a quarry. That's the light patch you see in the background. But there's a mill creek that goes right by. There's a little cliff. This site had the most individual bees. In fact, I found over 300 during one survey, mostly on this hill prairie, on that purple prairie clover uh, in the picture. So that was a lot of bees at that site. Uh, most of these sites are owned by DNR. Uh, Joshua Lindell uh, was the exception. That is private. Short Fork Seep is private. This one, Allendale Spring, is private. I think I have a couple more that are private. But for the most part, I've gone to a lot of DNR sites because they're owned and managed by DNR. It's easy to get permission. And the fact that we manage them makes it important for the future on how we manage them. Um, the, site, the private sites, I'm able to manage some of those as well. Uh, Lando cooperation has not been a problem. I'm just out taking photographs. Uh, so everybody's like, uh, no problem. Just let me know when you're coming or something like that, not a problem. This one, Allendale Spring, is a cobble stream going through a degraded you know, bush honeysuckle infested forest area. Once again, just like Short Fork, gets past the spring survey time and I can't get into the woods because it's just too dense. And so I had to basically um, sample along the edge of this uh, stream. There's a hay field there, it had a lot of uh, weedy plants in it that the pollinators were going to. And then there was a little trail through um, the far end of the forest that I could, could walk through. And so that's kind of how I sample. I try to get as close to the site as possible, um, but I have to be able to walk and take pictures. Allendale actually had the most number of flies. For some reason, the flies were really attracted to wild parsnip. And there was a lot of wild parsnip on the June survey. And so I got a tremendous diversity that day. Ellison Creek Sand Prairie is one of our newest nature preserves in Henderson County, which is a sand area similar to the Mason County Sands. Henderson County Sands just don't get visited very often because they're so far to the west. But we actually have a better floral diversity, a lot more uh, basically flowers blooming in Henderson County uh, than we sometimes see in Mason County. Um, so this site's a 40 acre sand prairie with some sand savanna. I didn't have as much diversity overall species wise, but I had some rare stuff because once again, the sand really provides a good substrate for ground nesting insects. Hawk Creek Sedge Meadow is another private site. Uh, much like Short Fork Creek, it is a seep sedge meadows. There's some ephemeral pools. There's a little stream going by and then some degraded woods because it had been grazed. Uh, fortunately, this one's closer to the road. So access to this larger uh, sedge meadow area wasn't as difficult and I did I did get some tremendous results at that site. Uh, let's see, I had the highest number of true bugs, lots of times plant bugs are associated with different species of plants, and the highest number of individuals last year. So 2019 I had the highest number of individuals at Haw Creek. Jubilee College Forest Nature Preserve. Uh, this one's up by in Peoria County, uh, up in the north part of the county there, uh, Jubilee College uh, State Forest there. And that site had a mowed trail uh, through the north edge of the forest. Uh, it's just kind of a service lane up there. That is the trail I walked. The spring count, I was able to get into the woods and count some of the woodland wildflower um, insects. But after that, the bush honeysuckle got too dense. I just couldn't make it in there. So I would just walk that north trail, which ended in a kind of a successional field with some of the weedy species. And I got a lot of pollinators on the weeds as well. Stony Hills Nature Preserve is privately owned. Uh, it consists of old crop fields, which are now planted to kind of a low diversity prairie and oak woodlands. Fortunately, this site also had a nice trail that I could walk through and I didn't have to fight any bush honeysuckle or multi-floor roads. I just stayed on that trail and did the loop. This site had a lot of bumblebees, which is always exciting to see. And my last one, Williams Creek Bluff Land and Water Reserve is within Weinberg King State Park in Schuyler County. Uh, it has like a nice cobble creek there, um, kind of oak hickory woods with a nicely maintained trail. The issue with this site was the loop trail in order not to backtrack was really long. And so I kind of had to walk really fast in order to try to get it done in 80 to 90 minutes. Uh, but I did want to sample the whole thing because uh, this is kind of a newly adapted, we kind of switched the uh, the boundaries of this uh, land and water reserve a little bit. And we're gonna be doing some, in addition to, they're burning it right now, uh, today. Uh, but we do a lot of, of fire management and we're gonna start doing some aerial spraying for bush honeysuckle there. And so we want to know what the current um, condition of the site is so we can go out after all that has been done and to sample again to see if there's been any changes. 
Okay, so results. I found about 560 species of insects over the two years. Not all of them are identified to species. Some of them I can only get down to a family or genus uh, based on just having to photograph. And they had, and I count the ones that have some association to flowers. The exception is I count all butterflies, skippers, and bees, no matter whether they're associated with flowers or not, because at some point in time, it's assuming they usually do associate with flowers. And I really want to know how those populations are doing. Um, I also report um, activity on 187 plant species. Over 90% of the species I did document with at least, you know, a couple photographs. I don't try to get every single individual photograph, but I do try to photograph every single species that I come across. I decided in 2018 to stop counting Japanese beetles because it got ridiculous and because the numbers were high and unfortunately they weren't high last year, but 2018 they were high and I just didn't feel like they were contributing positively to pollination. So I took those out, but everything else, flower visiting beetles, true bugs, etc., I did count. All bees, butterflies, skippers were counted. Like I said, I really want to know how those populations are doing. Diversity of pollinator species. So richness, how did the species, the total number of species that I'm counting kind of break out into the different groups? Interestingly enough, I did not expect this, but bees, beetles, flies, and all, really wasp too, all were about the same. They all represent the majority of the pollinators that I was seeing. Um, very interesting that beetles and flies are right up there with bees, even though my main focus, of course, is bees and butterflies and skippers. Those are the ones I'm really, really targeting. Uh, butterflies and skippers and even flower visiting moths just didn't seem to represent as many when it comes to species. Um, they, I think a lot of them, the habitat uh, changes have really impacted. Uh, some pesticides have impacted butterflies. And having done butterflies since 97, um, I noticed the numbers are going down. The numbers of individuals. So this is every single individual I counted. And once again, I'm going after bees and butterflies. And so you'd expect them uh, to be well represented. Um, I don't always photograph all my butterflies because sometimes if I see a tiger swallowtail, I know what it is. I don't need to chase it. I want to spend my time photographing the, the insects that I can't necessarily identify the species just by looking at them. So those are the ones I'm photo focusing on. I let the big you know, monarchs and swallowtails just drift off and, and don't chase after them. So in terms of abundance, once again, bees represent by far the most individuals, which is good. Well, I want to see bees because they're the most efficient pollinators because they're the only group of insects that's actually collecting pollen to feed their young. And so they're actively collecting it. All the others are collecting it because they're hairy and they're drinking nectar, or feeding pollen, and they're incidentally spreading pollen to hopefully the same species of plant. So a surprising number of flower beetles. So I really wanted to show off these uh, longhorn beetles. Uh, longhorn beetles are absolutely fascinating. You can see the pollen on some of these. Um, they're messy eaters. Uh, that's what makes a good pollinator. A messy eater with lots of hairs um, tends to spread the pollen around, provided that it's going to the same species. And a lot of these show a high fidelity to the same plant. And so they're just kind of, a lot of those beetles in the middle, they're just hanging around Carolina Rose. That is their plant. They are associated with Carolina Rose. And so that makes them pretty efficient as pollinators. So looking at generalist versus specialist, I mean, that's always a big argument. Um, how many, are you just seeing generalists? Or are you just seeing specialists? So about 54% is kind of an estimate of my 560 species were thought to be generalist or polylectic. In other words, they don't have a real preference for what type of flower they visit. Five species were found at all, all 12 sites, which is kind of interesting because my sites were so diverse in habitat type. So you really have to be abundant to be found at all 12 sites, but there was only five of them. And fortunately, one of those, one of those fives was not the honeybee. The honeybees in the next group though, of the 37 species were found at least nine out of 12 sites. Honeybees are everywhere, they're feral, they're escaping from hives and they're impacting our pollinators. Interestingly, this uh, great spangled fridlary, uh, which is in the picture, is considered a specialist as a larvae. The, um, all of the larvae of fritillaries feed on violets. But as an adult, the adult butterfly doesn't care really what plant it goes to. I mean, obviously it's got a certain proboscis and so it likes certain flowers that it can stick its long tongue into, but it has a huge array of flowers it visits. Specialists, oligochelectic, are mostly bees 
because bees have an affinity for certain different species of plants because they're collecting the pollen to get back to their young. However, there are a surprising number of beetles, flies, wasps, and even true bugs that also seem to be associated with only one plant species, genus, or family. Um, so they have that close tie. The great thing about knowing your botany is if you want to find those specialists, you know exactly where to find them. You go to a nice patch of that particular plant, there they are. Cuckoo bees. Now, 10% of just the bees, now this isn't all of them, were kleptoparasites. And kleptoparasites are really important because they're thought to be really good indicators of a healthy bee population. Kleptoparasites are very much like the brown head cowbird. They will, they basically don't make their own nest. They find, they have a host species and they follow her around until she goes into her nest. And as soon as she leaves, they sneak into her nest, they lay their eggs. When their larvae hatch, they kill the host larvae and then they feed on the resources. And the host, the uh, original cuckoo mom, doesn't have to provision that nest. She doesn't have to do anything. She lays her eggs. All she has to do is watch that host and sneak in and sneak out. Um, they are difficult to find. Um, you just don't see them, with the ex exception of this Nevada in the center, you see a lot of those in the springtime in the woods. But they traditionally, a lot of the cuckoos are hard to find on these types of surveys. What I learned. Um, I keep learning every single time I do these. It's, it's amazing. I learned a lot different things in 2019 than I did in 2018, and I'm sure this year I'm going to learn a lot more. Diversity was amazingly good at all sites. We keep hearing that the pollinators, the insects are going down, that we're losing insects, and I'm sure we are. Um, I don't know what was there 50, 100 years ago. I have no way of knowing that. All I can do is say right now we still have a good diversity. I think 560 species is a lot. I think we have a good diversity of, pollin of uh, pollinators or flower visiting insects at these nature preserves, land and water reserves. I, they may be acting as little oasis because they're surrounded oftentimes by you know, heavy agriculture. Um, so these are their last little holdouts. And you know, maybe in 10 years, this still isn't the case. I don't know what the tipping point is and when we start to really lose them. But right now, I feel pretty good about the diversity of insects we have. Have we lost some of the specialists? Absolutely. But there's a lot of research out there showing that a lot of these insects are learning to adapt to a wider array of food sources. Um, there's just a large number of them out there. Uh, some non-native plants are serving as food sources for these native insects. Um, I listened to a webinar recently that said that's probably not a very good thing, that we really do need to tr control our invasive species so that we don't lose our native plants because the, the insects are visiting the non-native invasive stuff because they're so much more prevalent than the natives. So I think it's really important that we continue our invasive species control. Community associations are problematic. You know, I was hoping to find, oh, this is a specialist on hill prairies. This is a specialist on wetland seeps. That's not so much the case because these insects won't stay put. They don't say, I'm going to stay here. They may like a particular flower, but they don't seem to associate so much with a particular type of community. In other words, if I go to a certain one, I don't, there's very few insects that I expect to be found because it's a particular community. So I'm still going to be working on that. That's going to take a while. That may not be the, the best way to uh, grade these community types based on insects. More things I learned. I'm much more efficient at photography and recording rather than attempting to catch and release. When I drop everything and try to put things in vials, that's fine if I need to catch something for identification later, but I lose my efficiency when I do that. I'm going to record a lot less species if I do that. Best to stick with easily accessible routes, path of least resistance. If there's a trail, I can find a lot more species on that trail simply because I don't have to fight my way uh, through the brush. Uh, once again, there's a reason why people do not go into wet mesic forest during the summer because stinging nettles hurts. They're awful. They're no fun. And you don't find any insects on them anyway. I mean, there's some butterfly larvae that feed on them, but you don't have flowers. So you don't have flower visiting insects. Um, they're really a monoculture. With help from these uh, websites, um, you know, all these experts getting on Bug Guide and iNaturalist is really nice uh, to be able to have that help and have access. The guy who does bees is actually from Singapore. He used to be from New York at the Natural History Museum, but now he lives in Singapore. And he does almost all of the bee photo identification for iNaturalist and Bug Guide from his palace in Singapore. And it was, he must be in one of those big high rises. That's, that's what I've heard anyway. John Asher is absolutely a wonderful guy.
And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. I, I didn't go any faster. There's a lot of material. I have a lot. I can't include a lot. You'll get you bored. So I'm going to call it at that. Thank you so much, Angela. And I'm just going to encourage people to pop their questions into that chat box. Um, and we'll use the next few minutes uh, to ask her some questions and um, answer anything that we've been wondering during the presentation. Anne asked, she was joking at the beginning when I asked how many or to what you were hoping to learn from this presentation. She asked, how do you get them to stop moving to get good photos? <laughs> yeah, flowers, flowers. Thank goodness there's flowers. flowers. They get, and you notice know, I always laugh. My interns always joke with me, but I get really excited when I find insects mating because then they're preoccupied and I can get a lot closer and I get the male and the female <laughs> together. So, yes, I, I, I chase mating insects. So. <laughs> yes. It's all science. Any right? other, right? Any other questions for Angela? Um, Michael asks, this is a more technical question, for macro photography, does macro length matter when trying not to disturb the subject? Are you using a 105 millimeter macro or a 60 millimeter macro, or are you using a telephoto? I've used both. Um, I, I know there's people that prefer, you know, the 100 millimeter and a little bit longer, up to 200. Um, I know Chris Young actually likes to shoot the longer length because you can get further away. But some of these mm -hmm. bees are so small that, you know, I already get all the details. I usually like to get close anyway. So a lot of times it's a matter of technique. I think right now um, I'm using a, um, gosh, I think I've used about an 85 millimeter. Um, I've gone down to the 60s and I've got 105 as well. Um, but I tend to go to the 60 to 80 millimeter range. I really like to get close to my subjects. A lot of times these insects, well, sometimes they'll land on my hand. Fortunately, I hope it's my left hand, not my right hand. I'm right-handed, I'm holding my camera with my right hand. So I can still take a picture of them if they're on my hand. Um, and that's, you know, obviously they're close when they're, when they're like that. But I, lots of times I'm getting down to, you know, six inches or less. Great, thanks. Uh, Debbie asks, she says, you mentioned butterflies are not as plentiful how do you know that this doesn't mean that sites aren't degrading slowly being the reason the butterflies are leaving? Well, I do butterflies. I've got three to four surveys I do every year and I've been doing them every year since 97. Uh, there are obviously significant habitat events that happen. Um, when, landowner, when landowners change hands, all of a sudden, sometimes all the milkweeds are sprayed and mowed. Um, then we just don't see any butterflies. I mean, there's, there's some significant things that have happened over time. Uh, we, we tend to get better in our skills, and so I'm a far more, far better identifying butterflies now than I was back in the 1990s. Um, so I feel like this is the same thing with the bird surveys I do. We try harder and harder on land that's getting worse and worse. Yes, they're degrading. Some of our areas are getting better that are being managed. I didn't notice a difference between managed sites and unmanaged sites get on this baseline, you know, initial survey. Um, I can't tell between, the, all the sites are so different, you can't tell from one to the other. So uh, we know that they're all degrading a little bit unless we're able to manage them. Some of these sites we are managing. Some of the sites like Cecil White is definitely getting better. Mead Savannah is gonna be getting better, not worse. Um, some of the sites we can't manage obviously are getting worse. So like I said, I thought this is initial collecting right now. We'll see what happens. That's why I want to repeat these every five years, five, 10. We'll see if I can go 15, 20. <laughs> I may not be working or DNR at that time, but we'll see. <laughs> Great. I've got kind of a softball question for you. Um, maybe just nerd out a little bit with us and tell us the last photo or the last insect observation you had that, that made you really excited or that you wanted to tell all your colleagues about. Ah, uh, well, the people who watch me out in the field, they, they laugh at me because I get excited about almost everything. Obviously, I've sure. got a goal. I'm very obsessive, if you can't tell. Um, I've got a goal to try to photograph as many species of insects as I possibly can in vertebrates. I'm, right now, I'm at 2,132. I keep very close tabs wow. on, on that list. And I found a few new ones just this weekend. And that's always exciting because the more you get, the harder it is to get a new species. 
Uh, and so I got a new beetle just in the yard. This I find a lot of things in my three acre yard, but always when I find something new, even if it's just a plane, in this case, it was a blister beetle, uh, but it's still exciting <laughs> to get a new species. Yeah. Obviously finding something rare um, would be great. If I can find something new to science, that would be even better. <laughs> I gotta keep working on that. That's awesome. Do you have a, um, uh, if you discover something new, do you have a name already or something that you you want to include yeah. in the naming of it? Well, I would name it after my son, unless the person, uh, my, my friend and colleague, Ray Giroff, uh, did find a new bee, new to science, and he's naming it after the guy who helped him identify it. So there's always oh, that. that nice. You gotta find out the circumstances. <laughs> if somebody else does the majority of the work, then, you know, they probably get them to name it. We'll see. <laughs> Super cool. Oh, don't want to put the um, any other, horse yet. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> any other questions in the chat? Um, um I, I had a I had a quick one, really quick. Um you had mentioned uh you you started phasing out the inclusion of like Asian beetles in um like kind of your, your collections and everything. Um are there any other like invasives that you've encountered in Illinois in terms of like pollinating insects? I mean, we hear a lot about just like, invasive plant species, but, um, and I know Asian beetle is something that has been a huge problem, at least a lot, a lot of farmers, that's been a big issue. Um, have you encountered anything else out there that's been either surprising or concerning in terms of non-natives out there? Well, fortunately, uh, we're starting to do a little bit of statistical analysis. I have an entomology professor helping me, and we're trying to run some statistical analysis. And so far, it's looking like uh, a lot of these species are fairly evenly distributed. There's not very many of them that are overly abundant. When it comes to the non-natives that I'm concerned about, obviously, Japanese beetle is one definitely concerned about. There are a few introduced bees. Uh, but the honeybee by far is the one I'm most concerned about because they are escaping and feral hives are being established on a lot of our nature preserves. Now I like honey, you know, that's fine. It's, it's a farm species. Um, I would love to get permission someday for, you know, a, a beekeeper to come in and remove the feral hive from our nature preserves and get it out so that we don't have this influx of lots of honeybees competing with the native insects on our nature preserves. The nature preserves are, you know, the highest level of protection in the state, and we really want to protect these for promoting natives. Other than that, there's not a whole lot. It's hard to know what's native and not because the Department of Agriculture has released so many different species out there to try to combat something, and they don't necessarily tell everybody. The most recent one is the enrolled ash borer. They are releasing a bunch of uh, wasps from China and whatnot. And at the rate that they want to release them, uh, it could be devastating to some of our, that's my opinion, to some of our native insects, some of our native borers. Um, and we just don't know. I'm really nervous about messing around with the system uh, because we always see these big peaks and then things come down. I mean, uh, zebra mussels, I worked on those when I first got started. And, you know, we're all worried about zebra mussels taking over everything. And they peaked and then they went down. And now we don't talk about zebra mussels anymore. Plants are a little bit different. Um, you know, invasive plants get ahead of us and we just can't seem to, to catch up. But trying to get people to understand that the honeybee is an invasive species that is detrimental um, and that we need to think about insects the same way to a certain extent that we do plants. So we need to be careful when we're introducing these things for whatever reason, if we're introducing something that doesn't belong, what are the other impacts that are going to happen. I don't care how much money you vetted it. You vetted it for a specific purpose to kill the emerald ash borer. You haven't necessarily vetted it for what other impacts could happen because it's, you know, if they're all related. It's all a domino system. If you start yanking things out, something could happen. No, that's incredibly interesting. Um, kind of a, another question I was thinking about, you know, in Illinois, and I'm sure, you know, in, you know, in most states, there was a lot of animals um, in general that are pretty widely distributed across the state, you know, like you can find just as a really simple example, you know, you can find a raccoon from basically any county or city or wherever you go. Um, are there any insects that you've encountered that are just are very hyper local in terms of like where they're located at? Like maybe something that you can only find if you go to this part of the state. And I mean, right. 
there's some animals that you have to go to like specific counties, especially plant species. Right. Uh, it's not yeah. that the sands would be anything. I mean, things that are found in the sand prairies are pretty localized. Um, now, to be able to answer that question, to understand a little better, we need more data from throughout the state. And getting that data and comparing that data is really tough. The Natural History Survey has some data. I'm trying to coordinate with them as much as they can in their data collection, but they haven't focused so much on uh, the big gaps are uh, hymenoptera, which is bees, wasp ants, flies, and beetles. Those have been a gap. We're not really paying attention to those because those groups are so big, everybody's overwhelmed by them. Uh, fortunately, we got some really good bee studies going on because bees are the, the in thing nowadays, which is a real good thing. But so we got a really good idea um, coming up as to what bees are found in what areas. There are bees in West Central Illinois that are far more abundant in just West Central Illinois. You go to other parts of the state and they're pretty scarce. Uh, so it's things like that that we're trying to tease out. We're not there yet. I've got a list of you know rare insects from those groups I just mentioned for the state, but we're still trying to tease out are there areas of the state where they could be more common and we're just looking in different places. So that's that's long-term project. And like I said, the more data we gather, the closer we get to you know achieving something usable. Are there very many insects represented on the endangered species list or do we not have, you know, enough data to make those sort of uh, designations? We have I know a that lot we have the honey, the biology. recent honeybee. Yeah, we have a lot of aquatic biologists. So the focus has been, when it comes to invertebrates, the focus has been on mussels. Everybody's going out to the rivers and we've got like 50 species of mussels on the list. Uh, the list of insects, I actually had it on a slide. I thought about it on this second presentation. I have it up there. Um, there's like 12. There's a couple of dragonflies. There's a couple of butterflies because, of course, you know, butterflies, dragonflies are big, showy, charismatic insects. So they're paid attention to. Um, I think there's one leafhopper. Um, I know Chris Diedrich wanted to nominate a few others, but was told we can't have more than one leafhopper. Um, so there's been that. We, People say we don't have enough information. We have a lot of information, but it takes somebody to nominate and to have the backing information to say, this species really deserves to be listed. Um, I missed this last round. We, weren't, we had a meeting about it. We discussed adding some new ones. We didn't really add anything yet because we're still in the information gathering stage. But the next round in five years, there will be more insects added. When are we ever going to attain the amount of uh, endangered species as there are with plants? Um, I it's going to happen in my lifetime, uh, but there should be. I mean, you think about how many insects are out there. there. There's no reason why we have more plants that are imperiled than insects that are imperiled. It's just we don't have the data uh, yet, or we haven't had a consensus on which species. The rusty patch bumblebee, when it got listed as a federal species, it automatically became a state listed species. So we do have a bee on the list and we have a watch list and that's right now what I'm working on is that watch list of potential species that could be listed. Now it's a huge huge list not all of them deserve to be listed they all are just being watched right now so we're collecting data on them but at some point in time we really need to start paying closer attention it's just right now everybody focuses on um, vertebrate animals they're more important uh, to some <laughs> And then up where obviously to plants because plants is the habitat. So there's a lot of botanists out there, fortunately. Although people will tell you there's not enough botanists, there are more botanists out there than uh, entomologists. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. And if no one has any more questions um, for Angela, they want to throw in the chat, maybe we'll end just a little early here. Um, and I just want to give you a big thank you. I know this was last minute. <laughs> Um, and we kind of pulled it together, but we really appreciate it. I know our conservation community and uh, our affiliates and partners were really excited about this presentation. Yeah. Well, I was supposed to give this talk at, at uh, several other places that got canceled, so I'm glad I listed oh, it. Well, <laughs> I'm glad that we gave you an outlet for that. Um, I see a few things in the chat. People are just saying thank you and thank you a lot. Um, well, with that, we'll let you go, let you get back to your day. And I just want to thank everyone who popped on. Um, this will be available on uh, YouTube and on our website afterwards. 
Um, is there anything else I'm going to leave you guys with before I head out? Yep, they'll be publicly available, um, including the resources uh, that she linked to in her site or in her slides. Um, and then I just want to remind you again that there is that um, link in the chat box to donate to IEC or become a member if this is something that you want to support. Um, and then Elliot or Jen, whoever's on, do you know, what do we have coming up tomorrow? Maybe just. Uh, I can, let me look really, let me, let me look really quick. Tomorrow's about microbial water quality with currents. So it's. Thank you. Fun. Thanks, Jen. Great. Well, we will hopefully see some of you guys tomorrow. And thank you, Angela, so much um, for showing off some of your fantastic pictures and your knowledge. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone.